It's good to be with you in the house of the Lord today. Come on, somebody say amen. 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 Hey, let's begin with a word of prayer before we open the word today. Would you join me? I want to pray for the, the sanctity of human life to be preserved in the United States of America. Can anybody get on board with that prayer today? Amen. And I want us to pray as well for our students. We have 26 of our teenagers and youth leaders that are up at our, their winter retreat up at our campground in Carlisle today. And uh, we're missing a lot of them right here, right now. I can tell, like, it's going to be a little quieter on this side. So you guys are going to have to hold it down for them. Appreciate your enthusiasm in advance. Uh, but we're excited about what God's doing in our students. And would you just join me in prayer? God, thank you so much for this morning as we've declared, Lord, the authority of your word over our lives. What you've said, we believe. And what you've spoken, it is done. And so, Lord, we come by faith under the authority of your word. As Jesus often said, let him who has ears hear what the Spirit is saying. So, Lord, we don't want to just, uh, we don't want to just uh, hear your word. We want to receive it. We want to apply it in our lives. God, we pray today for organizations like Align uh, and other organizations that are on the front lines of meeting people at their point of need in crisis moments, in decision moments. Lord, we thank you for uh, the strength we've seen in recent days of our Supreme Court justices to, to take a stand, not a political stand, a biblical stand for life. And we thank God for that in this nation. And we pray uh, that that righteous standard would be upheld in the years to come. God, we pray for our students today. Lord, let your presence saturate their lives. And may we feel the impact of it as they drive home safely this afternoon. In Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. Amen. If you have a Bible, I want to invite you to open it up to the book of Isaiah, chapter 64. As you're finding your way there, let me tell you what you're coming into today. We began the first three weeks of this year with a focus on prayer. So this is the third and final message in the series. And, and here's what we came away with last week. A simple understanding, one of the things we drilled down on is that prayer is communication with God. I know that sounds incredibly elementary for some of you, but let me just remind all of us that any communication worth having, any good communication is two-way communication. Uh, I'm not doing marriage counseling right now, but I think maybe I'll get a few head nods. You ever talk to somebody and, and you could just tell they weren't listening? Like the uh-huh, uh-huh started trailing off. And then they said, uh-huh, in the middle of the wrong spot, like a random moment, you're like, you're not, you're not hearing me. You're not hearing me. You know, if you talk to somebody and they don't reciprocate, they don't echo back your words. I don't know why y'all are laughing so much. I'm trying. <laughs> he's, going, he's getting real today. He's getting personal. But after a while, you don't really want to talk to that person anymore. I don't even know what I'm saying. And a lot of people, their prayer life is that way. They have no idea that God is listening. They don't know that that. That prayer is communication. It's a two-way street. It's not just me lifting up my laundry list of needs to God. It's me leaning in to hear the heart of God for my life. And so they lose heart in communicating with the Father. But all through Scripture, God calls to us an invitation, meet with me. And his invitation is that you and I can come up that we can come up by faith through prayer in the spirit. We can come up to where he is. Last week, our key text was Revelation chapter 4, verse number 1. I just want to read that verse again. I want you to see the invitation. It says, after this, I looked and there before me was a door standing open in heaven. And the voice I had heard first speaking to me like a trumpet. That was the voice of Jesus John's talking about. It said, come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. So if this is the voice of our Redeemer, and he's calling to us, his people, and he's saying, come up here, then can I tell you what the call of the redeemed ought to be? Come down here. Because when we pray, we're both saying to one another, meet with me. I want to meet with you. And so in, in Isaiah chapter 64, we see that heart cry uh, in the words of the prophet, the, the people of God saying, Lord, would you come down? I want you to see this verse, and this will be our, our key text for the day. There's five things I want to show you out of this portion of Scripture that happens when you say, Lord, would you come down here? 
would you meet with me? Let's look at the word together. Isaiah chapter 64, verse 1 and 2, it says this. After this, or excuse me, I'm reading Revelation 4. Isaiah 64, oh, that you would rend the heavens and what? What does it say? Come down. That the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Read it with me again. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and to cause the nations to quake before you. You know, when you open the first page of your Bible, what, what you find in the story of the Garden of Eden is that God walked in the cool of the day with Adam in the garden. I mean, we, we have no idea what that level of, of, of intimacy with the Lord is like. He walked with him in fellowship. He talked with him in the garden. And many of you know how the story played out. Adam and Eve, they, they chose their own will. They chose their own road instead of obeying God's command and not eating the fruit that was growing from the tree in the middle of the garden. They chose their own will and sin entered the narrative of humanity and God removed them from his presence. We, we can't even comprehend the weight of that. One of these days, when we actually stand physically and finally in the presence of the Lord, we'll realize what a blessing we've missed out on all this time. But at, when we pray, when we call on God, what we're essentially doing is we're asking God to, to, to bring us back in to that kind of fellowship. We're saying, God, would you, would you come back down to Eden? God, could we walk with you in the garden again? Could we have that kind of fellowship with you again? Prayer is calling God to walk with you. It's saying, God, I want to invite you into this moment. That's why prayer is not reserved for Sunday morning at 10 a.m. It's not reserved for the Wednesday night prayer meeting. It's not something that just happens at the altar or around the dinner table. At any moment, anywhere, you can invite God's presence to come in and walk with you in that situation. That's the access we have. And so this verse, it begins with those words, Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Now, that, that, that's a pretty poetic phrase, rend the heavens. But rend just means to rip apart. That's what it means. And, and oftentimes you'd see that in, uh, in the Bible. If someone was grieving or lamenting, they would rip their garments. They would rend their garments. God speaks prophetically at one time because the people were doing that as an expression of worship. But they were just doing the expression of worship. Their heart wasn't in it. God said to them, oh, I wish that you would rend your heart and not your garments. In other words, I'm, I'm not impressed by all the outward stuff you're doing because your heart's not in it. When Jesus said, it is finished, when he hung on the cross and died, the Bible says the, the, the veil in the temple was rent in two. It's that same word. It was ripped apart. So when we say in prayer, God, would you rend the heavens and come down? We're literally saying, God, would you rip apart the fabric of what separates your presence from us? The heavens doesn't always speak of heaven, you know, streets of gold, crystal sea. The heaven speaks of the atmosphere. As the, as the prophet's looking up, he's saying, God, we want to be near you. We want to meet with you. Would you rip apart what stands between your presence and us? It's interesting that the Greek philosopher Plato, he said this. He said, never can God and man ever meet. That was his philosophy. Never can God and man ever meet. Meet and, and the truth is, he was half right. Because if it's up to us to get to God, he's, he's right. Unless God rends the heavens and comes down. Then he's all wrong. And, and, and I, can I just say why we got up and came to church on a Sunday morning? Why we, why we you know, dealt with the cold weather and got, got the kids loaded in the car on the weekend? you know why? Because he did. He did. Spoiler alert, he came down. He came down. If you never read the New Testament before, John says, in the fullness of time, we have beheld him, the fullness of glory and truth. God became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Somebody else ought to say amen to that today. He came and dwelt with us. I, I quoted last weekend uh, a man by the name of Edward McKendry Bounds. He was a, a pastor and an author in the 1800s. He, he wrote 11 books. Nine of them were about prayer. And I read another statement from him I want to share with you today. It's kind of a lengthy quote, but he, he wrote out of concern for what he called the trend of the day. 
the trend of the day. And I just wonder, before I read this to you, uh, what his outlook would be, not in the 19th century, but now in the 21st century, if he could see that what he called the trend of the day has actually become the order of the day. Maybe before I even read this, I should just uh, speak to this issue. Maybe you're here this morning and you know, you've been serving the Lord for a long time. You're, you're, you're coming to the church this morning, your Bible's open, like, teach, teach me something new. T- t- tell me something I don't know. Show me a story I've never heard before. And, and there's, there's this sigh in your heart that goes, oh, prayer. Hmm. Okay. And a lot of times, that's our attitude towards those things that seem the most familiar to us. I was so touched by this statement by Ian Bounds. I want you to hear what he said. He said, we are constantly on a stretch, if not a strain, to devise new methods, new plans, new organizations to advance the church and secure enlargements and efficiency for the gospel. This trend of the day has a tendency to lose sight of the man or sink the man in the plan or organization. God's plan is to make much of the man, far more of him than of anything else. Men are God's method. We understand he's speaking about mankind, not just, not just men. Listen to these words. He said, the church is looking for better methods. God is looking for better men. What the church needs today is not more machinery or better, not new organizations or more and novel methods, but men whom the Holy Spirit can use, men of prayer, mighty in prayer. The Holy Spirit does not flow through methods, but through men. He does not come on machinery, but on men. He does not anoint plans, but men. Men of prayer. I think he's as right in 2024 as he was in the 1800s. And it's so easy for us to look at the the machinery and the mechanics and the methods and the strategies and and the resources. And even this service, we're online and and thank God for that. And and we're going to touch the nations through the internet. But how many of you know God's method is still his people? His people that are anointed and filled with his spirit. With a heart to pray. I want to show you five things that happen if God comes down. And he will when we call out to him in prayer. Number one, if you're a note taker, mountains tremble. Mountains tremble. Look at verse one again in Isaiah 64. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains would tremble before you. I wonder if there's anybody in the 10 a.m. service that has a mountain before you today. You ever had a difficult situation in your life that it just felt immovable? It felt like insurmountable. Like, I, I'm here, it's there, mountains don't move, so I got to figure out what I'm going to do next. In Mark chapter 5, there's, there's three back-to-back-to-back stories about impossible situations. And, and I love this insight into the ministry of Jesus. The, the first one, Jesus crosses the, the lake to the Gerasenes, and, and as, he, as he pulls up on the shore, he meets a demoniac. I mean, a person that, I don't just mean a person that's like tormented or, or demonized. I mean a, a demon-possessed man. Here's the description. Mark chapter 5, verse 8 says, or verse 3 says, this man, he lived in tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For He had often been chained hand and foot, but he tore the chains apart. He broke the irons on his feet. No one was strong enough to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and in the hills, he would cry out and cut himself with stones. I mean, just a this sounds like a a fairy tale, but this guy is just absolutely. Over uh, under the uh, oppression of demon spirits, he has supernatural, uncommon power. Nobody can restrain him. And yet verse 6 says, when he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and he fell down on his knees in front of him and he shouted at the top of his voice, what do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Now I got to just stop here and say, that amazes me. You know, the demons of hell have better theology than a lot of Christians. 
They understand he is the son of God, the most high. He's, the, he's not the big man upstairs. He's the most high God. He's not your homeboy. He's the most high God. And the demons recognize his presence and immediately the, the man falls on his knees. And, and the next verse tells us why. Verse 8 says, for Jesus had said to him. In other words, Jesus spoke first before he put his feet on the shore. And he said, come out of the man, you impure spirit. Immediately the man was healed. He was clothed, he was sitting, and he was in his right mind when the people of the town came out to see him. Jesus gets back in the boat, he goes to the other side. When he gets to the other side, he meets a woman who has an issue of blood. And the biggest issue with her uh, issue of blood is how long it lasted. The Bible says she was sick for 12 years. I don't know if anybody's got a mountain like that. that. Maybe on the surface level you would say, you know, my situation's not as bad as somebody else's, you know. But, but it's just, it hasn't, it hasn't gone away. It's just been, you've just dealt with it week after week, month after month, year after year. And, and after a while, even a small thing, it's like, it's like Chinese water torture. I mean, one drop at a time, it's just a persistent, agging, uh, punishing thing in your life. And this woman is facing this mountain. And then I love the picture that we see in Mark chapter 5. In verse 25, it says, This woman was subject to bleeding for 12 years. She had suffered a great deal under the care of, of many doctors, spent all she had, yet instead of getting better, she got worse. Boy, you talk about frustration. Not only are you, are you sick, not only are you, you you're unable to get better and recover, but now, now you're broke. Now you spent all your money. Now you went to the best that modern medicine could offer. And instead of getting better, she's worse. She's facing a mountain. Verse 27 says, when she heard about Jesus... She came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I'll be healed. Man, what a picture of prayer. That's just the, the tenacity of faith for somebody, you know, just I, 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 no disregard for, uh, no regard for everybody else and what they're doing. I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna press into God's presence because I know, I, I don't know what everybody else is doing, but I know if I can get into his presence, if I can touch him, if I can meet with him, I can be healed. And so she presses in, she touches the hem of Jesus' garment. And right there, in that moment, it says immediately, verse 29, immediately her bleeding stopped. And she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. And I love this because then the next verse says, at this, Jesus realized power had gone out from him. Like, this wasn't a prayer line she was standing in. He didn't even want to heal this lady. He, he wasn't like, he was just there. Don't you want that kind of power in your life? Like, wouldn't it be awesome if, if, as the people of God, we're just so filled with the Holy Spirit, you know, you get into, like, a crowded aisle 17 at Home Depot and bump into somebody, and they go, oh, man, what was that? <laughs> like, how great would that be? Like, oh, I'm sorry, I, I, I didn't mean to heal you of your sickness and disease. I'm just trying to, <laughs> trying to get a few screws from my, my deck, you know, like, come on, come on. I mean, Jesus is just so full of the power of God. Here's the thing, though. There were a lot of people touching him. In fact, that's what the disciples said when he said, who, who touched me? I felt power go out of me. The disciples are like, are you kidding me? The 10 a.m. service is packed. But you know, there can be a lot of people in God's presence and only a few that touch him. There can be a lot of people singing the song and only a few people that touch him. A lot of people hearing the message, but only a few people that touch him. It was, he said, no, 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 somebody touched me with faith. And then right there while he's talking to this woman about her story and her testimony, some people come over to a man named Jairus who's patiently waiting for Jesus to come and pray for his 12-year-old daughter. In verse 35 says, while Jesus was still speaking, some people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader, and they said, your daughter is dead. Why bother the teacher anymore? We talk about a mountain. This is the worst news any father could ever hear. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Your daughter's already dead. Verse 36, overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, 
just believe. Paul, I wish somebody would hear that word today. It's, it's so hard for us to do that. You know, you, 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 you didn't come for just believe. You came for the five steps to a healthy life by Friday, right? I mean, come on, we're like, give me, give me the nuggets. Give me the life hacks. Give me, give me the help. Like, what, what can I do? I mean, what can you tell me in this hour that's gonna make my life better on Monday? Only belief. Jesus looks him in the eye and says, only believe. Don't be afraid, just believe. Here's the thing, friend. If you have, uh, if you limit your faith to just what you know, you're gonna face mountains that don't move. But if you put your faith in Jesus, if you ask him to come down and to rend the heavens, Jesus said this, he said, if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can say to the mountain, be removed, and it'll be cast into the sea. In Zechariah chapter four and verse seven, the Lord declares this. He says, what are you, mighty mountain, before Zerubbabel? Zerubbabel was the, uh, he was the foreman on the job. They were rebuilding the temple, and it looked like an impossible task. And God says, what are you, mighty mountain, you're going to become level ground. Then he, the foreman, will bring out the capstone to the shouts of God bless it, God bless it. I love that. I love that. One of these days, I don't know when, but in the near future, we're, 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 going, to, we're going to build a church. And we're, we're going to build a new church on that property out there. And we're all going to, we're going to rally around it. And we're going to shout, God bless it, God bless it. And God tells Zerubbabel how that happens, how mountains become level ground. In the previous verse, he said, oh, he said, he said to me, this is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. When God comes down, mountains tremble. They tremble. Number two, maybe I should have just preached one today, but number two, fire burns, fire burns. Isaiah 64 says, oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you as when fire sets twigs ablaze. When God comes down, he comes with fire. The Bible says in Hebrews 12 that the Lord our God is a consuming fire. And we see pictures all through the Bible of God showing up in fires. Elijah on Mount Carmel, when he's standing before the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah, and, and he, he challenges them. They're, they're trying to call on their false gods, and he says, why don't you make a sacrifice to your God, and I'll make a sacrifice to the God of heaven. And whoever's God answers by fire will know he's God. So they spend all day pouring their heart out. They were singing and chanting and cutting themselves. And finally, Elijah rebuilds. He repairs the altar to the Lord, puts the sacrifice on the altar. He's got the wood there, but he doesn't stop there. He builds a trench around it and he has them feel, uh, fill up the trench with water. So he soaks, in other words, you know, wet wood won't burn. And so he soaks the altar and the trench is filled with water. And then he prays a simple but powerful prayer unto God. In verse 38 of 1 Kings chapter 18 says, Then, after he prayed, then the fire of the Lord fell and burned up the sacrifice, burned up the wood, burned up the stones and the soil, and it also licked up the water that was in the trench. God shows up by fire. Now, now here's the reality. I, we're gonna pray in a few moments and I have no desire for a ball of fire to come down and burn up the wood <laughs> and burn up the stone and burn up the, the water, you know. So what does it mean if God shows up by fire in your life? What does it mean in my life today? Well, there, there's a lot of applications. We don't have time to go into them, but let me just tell you three things that happen when God shows up. Fire represents his presence, have you ever been in a worship service or, or in, a, in a moment of prayer? Maybe you're just looking at a beautiful sunrise over the ocean or, or a mountain, uh, but, but you just felt the warmth of God's presence. You ever just had that, that, that undeniable sense, God 
God is here. That's what the two men on the Emmaus Road felt. After Jesus was crucified, he had already risen, but they didn't know he was alive again. And they're walking with him on the road, and then they share uh, a meal with him, and he breaks the bread, and he disappears from their sight. And then they're standing there looking at each other. And here's what they said. Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked with us on the road? Like once he was gone, we realized like that feeling that you have when you know that you know that you know you've been with God. When his fire comes, there's a presence. Another thing his fire does is his fire purifies. The scripture says the silver's for the crucible and the furnace is for gold, but your heart and my heart is for the Lord. And it's a picture of how, you know, if, if you're trying to purify gold, what they would do is you would put the gold in the fire. And, and the, the longer you keep it in the fire and the hotter that fire is, the more pure the gold is. Some of you, you have a, a very fine gold ring and you know it, it's finer gold than your other jewelry because it's more pliable. When you take it off, it used to be round, but now it's shaped like an egg because that's the shape of your finger and, and, it, and it's molded. But to make it more pure, to make it of higher quality, it has to be kept in the fire longer. And the impurities rise to the top and they, they, they scrape away the dross and you have a pure gold. And God says, that's what the fire of my presence does in your life. God's presence purifies you. It refines your life. His presence also speaks of power. Jesus told his disciples before he ascended up to heaven, he said, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. I mean, these guys are ready to go out and attack hell with a squirt gun. I mean, they're, they're like, we're ready. Like, let's go. Let's do the mission. And he said, no, I want you to go to Jerusalem. I want you to wait. I want you to wait for the promise of the Father. You'll be baptized. And he said in Acts 1 and 8, when the Holy Spirit comes on you, you shall receive power to be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. So they did. They went to Jerusalem, and they waited. For 10 days, they prayed, and they waited. And they didn't have the book. Like, we have the book. We know what it looks like when the Holy Spirit comes. They had no clue. And so God gave them an evident sign that this is what was promised. This is the promise of the Father. Do you know what the sign was? It was fire. It was fire. The Bible says tongues of fire came down and, and, and sat upon each one of them in that upper room. Now, God doesn't do that today. In fact, that's the only time he did that. But he was doing a new thing, and he wanted them to know this new thing is my thing. And so I'm going to give you a sign that's been consistent throughout the history of my people. The fire is my presence. And when the fire came, power came. When we come to God in prayer, we're going to sense his presence. We're going to be purified. We're going to be like him. When you spend time in God's presence, he purifies your life into his image. And he's going to give you the power that you need to effectively serve him. E.M. Bounds, here's another great quote from his writings. He said, the first and last stages of holy living are crowned with praying. It is a life trade. I, I love that idea of prayer as a life trade. I mean, I look around this room. I, we got lots of tradesmen in here. And there was a time you weren't good at it. <laughs> you know, you were an apprentice maybe. Uh, you were a student. You didn't really know what you were doing, but you, you were faithful. You were disciplined. You were studious. You made mistakes. You didn't get it all right, but you figured it out. You worked at it. And today, you, you're skilled. You're a tradesman. That's your level of expertise. What if we looked at prayer as a trade? What if we looked at our prayer life that way? What if we said, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep doing this. I'm going to perfect this. I'm going to keep going after this until I become devoted in prayer, until I become fluent in prayer, until I, I become efficient in my prayer life. Here's the third thing that, that happens from Isaiah chapter 64. The mountains tremble. Fire burns but verse 2 says, as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Number three, water boils when God comes down. To be passionate about God, get this word picture in your mind, is to be boiling hot. Now, I've known some people that were boiling hot, but they weren't hot for the Lord. They were mad. You ever, you ever, you ever been mad, boiling hot? I mean, I can, I can, I can even remember like this was a thing down south. I had family that would say, 
Ooh, I'm about to boil. You know, they didn't mean they were cooking noodles. You ever had somebody, you said, oh, he makes my blood boil. <laughs> Maybe that's a southern thing too, I don't know. But, but the Bible says that our fervor, our passion, our zeal for the Lord ought to be at boiling point. Listen to this word from uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 11. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. The, the, the Greek word picture that, that we translate as spiritual fervor is boiling hot. In fact, that's the way the Passion, translates, uh, the Passion Translation uh, writes that. I love this translation uh, for this verse specifically. It says, be enthusiastic to serve the Lord, keeping your passion toward him boiling hot. That's literally what it meant in the original language. Keep your passion for the Lord boiling hot. Hot. Okay, let me just uh, state the obvious that we all know here to be true. Prayer is hard when your heart is cold. It's hard. And we've all been there by that. That's not a, a condemning statement. It's just a, a true statement. We've all been at that place where, you know, maybe our heart's not in it. You know, you look down the row and somebody, man, somebody's touching heaven. Somebody, somebody's got the hem of his robe in the grasp of their hand, obviously. Like, I don't know what they drank for uh, their coffee this morning, but <laughs> I'm not there today. We know it's hard to pray when our heart is cold. But that if, our, if, our, if our heart is warmed by the glow of his presence, if the fire of his presence burns inside of us, then, then it, the words come easily. The focus comes more easily to us. And the Bible challenges us. D don't lack in zeal. Keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord at boiling point. God, God wants to do that. When we say, God, would you come down? It's an honest prayer, but to say, God, I, I just, I don't feel the passion. I, I, I don't feel the passion that I used to feel. I don't feel like I'm as close to you today as I was a year ago. But God, would you come down? Would you rend the heavens? Sometimes for us, the heavens are just busyness. Whatever that thing is that separates you from God's presence, sometimes the, the heavens between you and God is, is, is your own sin. You know, sometimes it's just distraction. Whatever it might be, when you say, God, would you, would you rend the heavens? Would you rip apart the fabric of what separates your presence from me? And Lord, would you draw me near? Would you come, would you come down? And all of a sudden, God will begin to restore the heat and the joy in your life. He'll bring your life to boiling point. The fourth one is this. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down that the mountains would tremble before you as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies. You know what happens when God comes down? Fourthly, victory comes. Victory comes. I, I love this prayer. He said, would you come down and make your name known to your enemies? And can I just say, if God's gonna make his name known, He's only going to be known in one way, victorious. That's who he is. In fact, did you know one of the names of God is my victory? Jehovah Nisi, the Lord, our banner, or the Lord, our victory. That, that, that name of God comes from a story in Exodus 17 where Moses is, uh, he tells Joshua to lead the Israelites into a battle against the Amalekites in the valley. And he says, while you're in the battle, uh, while you're in the battle I'm going to go up on the mountain. And this is a picture of intercessory prayer. He says, I'm going to take the staff, that rod that God used to deliver his people that represents his presence and part the Red Sea. I'm going to take that staff and I'm going to hold it up in my hands on the mountain while you go and fight in the battle. And the Bible says supernaturally that whenever Moses had his hands up high, the Israelites were winning the battle. But when his hands grew tired and he put the rod down, the Amalekites would begin to get the upper hand. And so the two men that were next to him, they went with him, Aaron and Hur. They said, we're going to go with Moses. And they took stones and they, they propped it up under him and they gave him a seat so that he could rest, so they could hold his hands. Oh my gosh, if we had a church full of Aaron and Hur's that would say, you know what? I know you're in a storm. I know you're in a battle. I know you're feeling weary, but I'm going to pray with you. I'm going to sit with you. I'm going to come alongside you and hold your hands up. I'm going to make sure that you get the victory. And they joined him in that moment of prayer. And God brought an incredible victory that day. And then after that, 
it says right after the victory in Exodus chapter 17, verse 15, it says, Moses built an altar and he called it, the Lord is my banner, Jehovah Nisi. Why, why, why a banner? You, you've seen the, the, the movie adaptations, I'm sure, that when a battalion was going into battle, somebody would carry the flag, you know, so that brave heart moment, like just charging ahead with the flag. And they see that flag and they follow that flag. And then when they win the battle, they plant that flag. So Moses in this moment is declaring, Jehovah Nisi is the God who, who goes before me into my battle. He's the one who establishes that we have the victory. I might be over here losing in a skirmish, but I can see over there the Lord is my victory. I might feel like a failure, but I can see the banner of the Lord declaring that we have the upper hand. And when God shows up to your enemies, he shows up victorious. I wish I had time today to just talk about all the names of God. Let me, let me just read a couple of them to you. God is called Adonai. That means master. God is revealed in scripture as El Shaddai. That means the Lord God Almighty, the all-sufficient one. Some of you need to call on El Shaddai because you, you don't feel like you have sufficiency for the day, but he is the all-sufficient one. One of his names is El Elyon. It means the most high God. The demons knew that name when Jesus pulled up on the shore. El Olam means the everlasting God, the eternal God. He's the ancient of days, the one who was, who is, and who is to come. One of the names of God is Jehovah Reah. I love this one. It means the Lord is my shepherd. He's my friend. Jehovah Shama means the Lord is there. Isn't that great? Like no matter where you're at, what you're going through, Jehovah Shama, the Lord is there. He's right there. Another name is Jehovah Sidkenu. It means the Lord, our righteousness. If you feel like you've been falsely accused, if someone's brought an accusation against you, good news. You can call out to Jehovah Sidkenu, the Lord, our righteousness. Or, or Jehovah Mekedesh means the Lord who sanctifies me. Have you been struggling with sin? Have you been struggling with addiction? Have you been struggling with, with besetting sins in your life? Call on Jehovah who sanctifies you. Or Elohim means the creator God. Or Jehovah Sabaoth means the Lord of hosts. Just like when the prophet Elijah was surrounded by all of his enemies and he said, God, would you open the eyes of my servant? Help him to see the Lord of hosts whose angel armies surround those who surround me. Or how about Jehovah Jireh, the Lord, our provider. Some of you, you're just struggling to, to make ends meet. You're struggling to feel like you're going to have enough. You need to begin to call on Jehovah Jireh, the provider. Or how about Jehovah Shalom, which means the Lord, our peace. Can I just say this to you? God has a name for whatever you need. He's got a name for whatever you need. And when we say, Lord, would you rend the heavens and would you come down? What he does in that moment by his power is he makes his name known to your enemies. Now, Some of you are going, but I can't remember all those names. <laughs> I didn't write them down. You didn't put them on the screen. Let me give you one more name. One more name I think you'll remember. Philippians chapter 2 verse 9 says, Therefore God has exalted him to the highest place and given him the name that is above every other name, that at the name of, say it with me, Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Friend, you only need one name. It's the name above all the other names. Because the word says that Jesus is the fullness of God in bodily form. That's why we pray in his name. We pray in the name of Jesus and heaven comes down. Look at the verse one more time with me as our worship team comes. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. That the mountains would tremble before you as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down. To make your name known to your enemies and to cause the nations to.
to quake before you. Number five, when he comes down, nations quake. Nations quake. My prayer is that you would get a right perspective on who it is we're praying to. I mean, this is the God who the Bible says he, he measured the oceans in the span of his hand. This is the God who, who knows the stars he, by name. He spoke. It says he flung them into their place and they stay there upheld by the power of his word. This is the God who the, the Bible says the heaven is your throne room and the earth is your footstool. I, I often think about that picture when I sit down in my recliner. You know, my dad, um, he always had one of those rec recliners, you know, with the emergency hatch lever. You know what I mean? Like, shpoom, you just throw that thing back. But I got the new age one. It's just a button. So I, I sit down in my recliner, and I push that button. It goes, zzzz. And I just, just, just lay back. And sometimes I look down, and I just think, the earth is his footstool. Like with all the things I got going on, the earth is his footstool. Can he not heal my daughter of sickness? The earth is his footstool. Can he not help us build this church? The earth is his footstool. Can he not, can he not meet your needs? Can he not touch this community? Can he not save a nation? Nations quake when he comes down. I mean, here we are praying these little peon, pusillanimous prayers, and he makes nations quake. Here's what God said in Psalm chapter 2 and verse 8. Ask me, and I'll make the nations your inheritance. And we ask these, Lord, if you could just do this, I don't want to burden you too much. If you could just... The earth is his footstool. Oh, if we could get a right perspective of who it is we're calling on. We're going to end by just taking a moment to pray together. I, I just want to pray the word of God. This is what we often do on Wednesday nights in our prayer meeting. I really felt to start this year by bringing that experience into our Sunday morning gathering. So I, I want to invite you to stand with me. The worship team is just going to softly just worship the Lord. And I just want to pray over you. And I want to invite you to let your voice join the chorus of prayer in this room today. Let the Lord speak to your heart as you speak to his. God, we thank you today that you are willing to respond to the prayers of your people. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down. Lord, whatever that is, whatever that barrier, it's more than space. It's more than atmosphere. God, there are things that hinder us from getting into your presence. Sometimes it's our lack of faith. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's distraction. Sometimes it's disobedience, disbelief. God, would you rend the heavens? Would you tear apart the fabric of what keeps us from your presence that, God, we could walk Walk with you today. We could sense the fire of your presence. Lord, bring our passion to boiling point again. Lord, we pray that you would cause mountains to tremble. The impossible situations that we're facing right now, God, we speak to those mountains. Can I encourage you to do that? To pray with specificity right now. If there's a, if there's a diagnosis that you're up against, speak to that mountain. Cancer has to leave in Jesus' name. Chronic illness has to leave in Jesus' name. Arthritis has to leave in Jesus' name. Speak to the mountain. They tremble in his presence. Jesus, we speak your name over every mountain. And God, we ask that the fire of your presence would burn in our hearts. That we would be so keenly aware that you are with us. As your word declares that we're not going to be trusting in our own understanding, but acknowledging your presence, knowing that you're going to lead and guide and order our steps. Lord, we want to receive the power of your spirit. We want your spirit to purify our lives today. God, for those that just, they feel like they've been far from you, 
They feel like the heavens are brass, that they're closed up and that their prayers can't break through. God, thank you today that you brought us into this hour to call upon you that you would rend the heavens and come down. And God, when you do, would you let your name be displayed to our enemies today? God, I thank you that you have a name for every need in the room. You are the all-sufficient one. So Jesus, we speak your name over every need. We call out to the one who makes the nations quake, who makes the demons tremble. We call out to the one who sits at the right hand of the majesty of God on high and ever lives to intercede for us. Jesus, we call out in your name. Let your kingdom come and let your will be done on the earth as it is in heaven. Come on, just take a moment now and just thank him for his faithfulness. Just thank him for his faithfulness. Thank you, Lord Jesus. You said it. It's done. We believe it. more time would you just press in my faith Come on, would you just give God a hand clap of praise all over the room today? God, we bless you. Thank you for the word that you're speaking over us. God, may we apply it. May we walk in it with boldness and confidence. Knowing that while we're asking you to come down, Lord, you're saying, come on up. Climb the ladder of prayer. Step into my presence that my will would be done in the earth, even as it is in heaven in response to the prayers of my people. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen, amen. God bless you. Yes, amen. As we end the service today, uh, let me just uh, encourage you with a couple things. Uh, one, if you need prayer, if you want somebody to just pray for you personally, we've prayed collectively, but our prayer team will be up here at the front of the room and they'd love to minister to you further in the next few moments. Uh, as you leave, I'd encourage you to grab one of those baby bottles and help us do some good with Align uh, services. And let me remind you, next Sunday is Vision Sunday. You don't want to miss it. We're so excited about what God has in store for us this year. God bless you, church.